Center for Educational Initiatives and Research, CEIR Global Trust, was started in 2009 with a vision to facilitate the evolution of positive and progressive schools through a passionate community of practice and emerge as the most trusted organization for educators across India and Indian schools globally. Good. Uh, welcome back. Uh, uh, we have two programs. Uh, uh, you know, Raji Ma'am will explain. Uh, welcome to all uh, to invite our chief guest. I uh, request Rajashmi Ma'am. Ma'am, please. Ma'am, you have to unmute. You have to unmute. Good evening to all members of the CEAR family. A warm welcome to the program today's session, NEP 2030, and joyful experiential learning, glimpses of class practice by Dr. Anju Shastri. A warm welcome to all of you. I consider it as my privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Anju Sasser, because I have earlier also, I have visited the site of MGIS for just to find out experiential learning. And many of you must have done that the similar way. So the magnificent personality, she is here to enlighten us. A short introduction of her doesn't mean that she she is uh, or mean that she is a great person with humility. Dr. Anju Stasit is the founder of the Mahatma Gandhi International School established in 1980, 98 under the trust of Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation. She teaches languages, theater and philosophy at MGIS. She has a doctorate in education from King's College London, a master's in sciences of education from University of Paris, a degree in linguistics from University of Strasbourg, and a master's in English literature from Gujarat University. She has created, generated resources learning, an innovative, joyful, and multi-sensorial pedagogy. And I have visited the site exactly to find out what it is. Anju has over 25 years of experience in innovative teaching, conducting parenting workshops, teacher training and conferences across India, France, Switzerland, USA, Canada, Russia, and Australia. She is working with CBSC and NCRT for curriculum development and teacher training. Currently, she is an expert member for toy-based pedagogy and the Holistic Progress Card National Committees constituted by the Ministry of Education. She is a member of the National Focus Group, create the new National Curriculum Framework. Publisher, author, and columnist. She is 
She received the Civil Society Award by the Election Commission of India by former President APJ, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. She is developing a curriculum for the expansion of human conscience, consciousness through science and spirituality in school education for well-being and empowerment. Her dream is to make the school a happy place for the children and she is working towards it and all of us will be eager to implement the same thing. For next one hour, she will be empowering us, enlightening us. And after, for one hour, we will not be liking to shift from our places and we will be listening to her. And after that, there is a physical activity to shift you by the bubbly Kaume Santosh for 15 minutes, 6 to 6.15. So a warm welcome to Anju Chasit and all the honorable members of this family. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. La Raja Lakshmi and uh, Dr. Gopina. Thank you for inviting me on this forum. Uh, you've set the bar very high with all these expectations. I hope I live up to that. Very and nice. to begin to begin today's session, I would like to begin with a small activity. Generally, I do it with mudras, but today I thought I'll do my other activity, which children love, which is brain gym. Uh, but because we're on Zoom and we can't do it with the body, we'll do it with our hands. And this is with fingers. So if you just put your fists out like that, and you have to put the thumb of one hand out in the same direction and the little finger out like this. So for me, since you're watching me in mirror image, uh, you can just do exactly as I'm doing, right? You've done that. And then you take it in and you do the opposite. So every time in the same direction, there is a little finger of one hand and the right, the thumb of the other hand. So thumb and little finger. Okay. There. Yeah. Some of you've got it, but not entirely. <laughs> so, so there you are. This is a good little exercise for children and for you. And of course, there are lots more you'll find on YouTube. So I've not invented that. I wish I could take credit, but I haven't. So there are many others where you can, you know, when you can do this. So you'll find them on YouTube. I won't go into detail to teach you that. Uh, you'll find that, but it's very exciting because I'm doing this because when we are talking about experiential learning, experience shapes our brains. And a uh, new experience forges new neural pathways in the brain. That's what research tells us. But common sense, more than research, common sense tells us that human beings learn through experience. And interestingly enough, in the last few centuries, uh, more specifically, because in India, we have been a colony, we have had a colonial model of education. And as a result, the body has been in exile in education for several, several centuries. And if you look at, if you trace human development, human history, you will find that we have put children on hard wooden benches, finger on their lips, don't talk, don't speak, don't ask questions, and we've subjugated the body. In fact, the body, we've rendered it immobile and invisible. So the idea for me when we started the school, my husband is from France, I'm originally from India, I'm from here, born and brought up here. And for both of us, it was very interesting that my husband, who's also an educator, we founded the school together. Our idea was to bring joy back into education, to bring the body and the senses back into the education because we learn through our bodies. And uh, every time we do a new, a new experience, a new activity, something new, then a new neural connection is formed in the brain. And that's how the brain expands. Uh, to take another analogy, you know, when you're going to from your home to office or to school, you're taking one particular road. And every day, if you take the same road, at some point in time, it becomes mechanical. You don't even realize. You don't even notice the things. And uh, it's nice to take new, new roads to discover. So this is the idea about experiential learning. It's not a new concept, of course. But I want to put a little disclaimer there or to put a little... Uh, nuance there. Everything is an experience, right? NEP is talking about experiential learning, but even getting bored in a classroom or even getting or being fearful in a classroom is an experience. 
So experiential learning by itself doesn't mean anything. We need to talk about joyful experiential learning. And that's what I'm going to do with you. So today, I'm going to share a lot of activities with you. Uh, being a teacher myself, and I still teach, I know one thing. It's all great to talk about great concepts and say, speak from podiums and tell teachers, you should be doing this and that. But teachers always have in their mind, show me how. It's all easy to say everything. But in the classroom, when I'm facing 25, 30, 35 children, how do I do things? And that's where I come from. I'm going to show you the how. The what of learning is no longer important. The content is no longer important because our content has become democratic. We can source content from us lots of sources, including the YouTube and other things. But what's really important is the how. How do you do things? So uh, having said that, let me now start my presentation uh, very quickly. So I'm going to, I hope you can see this. Can you see the, can you see the uh, screen? Yes, ma yes, ma yes, yes, yes. Perfect. So what we call it, so the school is called Mahatma Gandhi International School. And uh, as mentioned, it is under a trust of the municipal corporation. So this is a PPP model school. And the idea for us, my husband and myself, when we started the school, was to state that India is not a poor country. India is just a country where we don't use our resources well. So if we can take a municipal school, a municipal school and transform that into an international school where we, our children can also prepare for international boards, whether they are rich or poor, then we would make a mark, uh, we would make a statement because you don't need great infrastructure if you have it fantastic, but even with the simplest of infrastructure, uh, we can actually have quality education. And the quality happens by practices inside the classroom. So this is uh, called international because we have several international boards. Though the school campus is very small, it's a municipal school building in the heart of the city of Ahmedabad. So uh, we are calling it co-creative experiential learning now because uh, co-creation, creation, creativity, and creating together, collaborating on that is an important part of human development and human empowerment. So that's what I'm going to show you now. Uh, in the beginning of my presentation, I like to begin with a personal story as well as a story which is very important and close to my heart. Uh, this is a photograph of uh, my daughter, Pascal and my daughter, whose name is Tara. And Tara is no longer in this physical world. Tara left us in 2014 and the physical world. And she's definitely there in a spirit form every time I make a, con you know, a presentation. And after she left this physical world, we found a lot of her poetry, uh, which was later published by Aurobindo Ashram and also by British Council. And I like to begin with one of her poems, uh, Who Am I? Who am I? Am I a human? Am I an animal? Am I a soul or just a body? But though I now I lie in this bed, one day I will be on my own feet running and all of my dreams will come true. But I still have to find who I am. And this thought I had written when she was just nine or 10 years old. So this is the starting point of my presentation because why do we go to school? We go to school to learn something about ourselves. We are incarnating, we're taking a physical incarnation on this earth for a purpose. And if life doesn't have meaning, if we don't find our life purpose, if we don't live our lives to the fullest uh, of our own potential, then we are not going to be happy souls. And Tara was a very, very happy child as she, for the few years that she was with us, she blessed us. and. Um, it was a sudden infection that took her. So what I want to tell you is that whatever the time we may have on this earth, we must lead happy, fulfilling lives. And that's the purpose of education, to allow children to find that space, to get in touch with themselves. So having said that now, let me go uh, a little back into the history of education. Very quickly, I spoke about colonial education. This is a... Uh, a philo well, philosophy or framework given by Michel Foucault, a French philosopher and uh, researcher who speaks about what are the commonalities between army, hospitals, schools, and prisons. And if you look at that, uh, prisons and schools, for example, the uniforms, the monitor system, the roll call, the morning assembly, the seating arrangement, the supervisory eye, uh, all come from physical uh, from the prison systems. So even the timetable is actually coming from the prison or this uh, 
army model. And you can see the way children are seated. This is like the prisons where each child is in an individual cell and cannot interact with each other. So the timetable itself, uh, which was based on the idea of that children should not be wasting time. It's a moral offense and an economic dishonesty coming from the industrial revolution, but children have to be engaged in some activity all the time. But we know from our Indian philosophy and from a lot of our models that relaxation and connecting with nature, having that time out is very important to be inspired and to be connecting with other, other sources within ourselves. So uh, that model, moving away from that model, that kind of a model has led us to a lot of uh, trauma in children. Uh, you know, even our education systems have led to suicides amongst children because they don't get the marks that they think they ought to be getting. And um, if I felt that if education can create such disorders, it can lead to emotional uh, trauma, then the opposite is true. A happy school will lead to mental and physical well-being. And that was a very important premise uh, for us when we started the school. So here, uh, the what is a kind of idea for well-being? Children should have choices. They must have a purpose in the learning. It shouldn't be just for some academic reason because the board says it or some syllabus says it. The purpose must be important to the children. It must be connected to their lives. We have to move away from competitive models, from competing for survival, which is an exclusion model, model based on exclusion, to thrival for all. Thrival is inclusion. Thriving means everybody ought to be thriving. And of course, Swaraj, the Gandhian concept of Swaraj, which means um, governance, self-governance. But this idea of self-governance is also including interdependence, understanding that I am part of a larger whole. So uh, what is the kind of model that is important for learning? First is the environment of the school. And our school, for example, is a democratic school where children make the rules themselves. Now, we don't have uniforms, as you can see. We don't have textbooks. Children learn uh, through projects that they do, all that I'm going to share with you, moving away from that model that I spoke about. So democratic uh, seating arrangement, democratic decision-making. So children make the rules from kindergarten to higher classes, and they follow the rules. Every week or every 10 days, they have what is known as a council meeting. The whole class functions as a council. There's a president and secretary by um, by, by chits that they pick up by rotation. And if they have any issues, they have to resolve it by discussion and dialogue. Uh, we teachers, we don't call ourselves teachers. I will, uh, we call ourselves initiators. Uh, I will also explain that a little later. So this is just one of the fundamental principles of the school that children participate in the rules that they have to follow and uh, they must follow because they frame the rules. And one of the other important rules that maybe we do talk about as a non-negotiable is non-violence because we are based on the philosophy of Gandhiji. Uh, the seating arrangement again, breaking away from that cell structure. And you know we were a municipal school, so our space was very less. So what we did was we put up tables which go up to the walls. They, there's a clip and the tables go back to the wall and the floor remains free. Children sit in groups around tables and there is no fixed seating arrangement. Uh, so what happens is the children can move between groups and the, and the uh, initiator or the teacher, what you call teacher, would move between different groups also. More accessibility is there uh, towards the children. The fundamental premise of the educational model that we created, which was inspired from a lot of great uh, Indian educators as well as Western practitioners, uh, but we called it uh, generated resource learning because we said everything is a resource to learn. And the most important resource that everybody has, any school, whether rich or poor has, is the body, the space, and the daily objects. And this is the starting point. So how do we use, for example, uh, the floor? The floor is a space, you know, in the classroom. And as you saw, the, the tables go up onto the walls, and we use the floor to learn because we didn't have that much of space outside. So the children up here, you can see they are making the world map on the floor. And in order to do that, they're using a lot of poster paints and everyday materials, ropes, etc. And you can see here that they have uh, finished their uh, map on the floor. And now this becomes a giant board game. So they pick up chits and the chit might be saying uh, Amazon River or Ganga River. So if they go and stand there, so they'll play games like that. And then it can be in pairs where one child is with eyes closed and the other child has to take the child and leave them somewhere. And the child has to guess 
where am I? So all of this bringing in spatial work and uh, geography concepts, uh, language concepts, etc. But also very important is uh, skills, collaborative work and everything as a game. And look at the resources. It is absolutely the simplest available resources. It's poster paint and water, and which is washed off by the children when they wipe the floor clean. The environment of the body. A lot of Teachers used to tell me, all this is fine, you know, you can learn with all this Montessori system, this, that in younger classes, but what about older children? So I like to show this picture. Your children are ninth standard children learning about the periodic table in chemistry. And here they're doing what we call the atom dance, which is part of a larger module, a multi-sensory module to learn about the, um, the periodic table. So here you can see that the children are electrons in an atom. So they've picked up chits. Uh, every group gets such it. They have themselves written down the elements and they have to show the configuration by the number of elements, uh, the electrons in the atom. And they have to do a choreography of a dance, but the dance has to be in relationship to the nature of the element and they have to justify that. And the rest of us who are watching, you have to guess after the presentation is over, what is the atom that they're presenting. So you can see when it is carbon, they're doing a tight dance. If it is oxygen, they'll be doing a more fluid dance, etc. So these are the kind of things we do for learning uh, with the body. The same idea of atoms, you know, learning again through beads and paper. So they're working in pairs, eyes closed. One of the two uh, children has put the beads in a particular way and the other child with the eyes closed is just touching and feeling and trying to guess what is the atom by the uh, just by tactile sense being used. So in this manner, we're using many different senses because then multi-sensory learning means that this learning is being integrated through the different senses. Uh, so what we're doing is we're moving from fragmentation of knowledge body to connection, connection to yourself, your body, your environment, your community, etc. We are moving from competitive models, competition to cooperation, and we're mo moving from repetition root learning to creation. That's the movement. Now let's see how all of this, these different pedagogies fall under projects, projects that children are doing. So this is uh, towards uh, umbrella projects. For example, here is a cafeteria. So children are learning a very simple thing, which is how to make lemonade, lemon and water. In order to do so, they are looking at the level of sugar and uh, water and uh, salt, etc., And they are then learning polynomials or equations with X and Y and the levels and they're tasting and they're doing their own service. Similarly, they go back to their food habits and they're tracking their own food uh, intake and looking at how much of carbohydrates or other nu nutrition they are getting. And from there comes the idea that maybe we don't have a balanced meal and what is a balanced meal? And let us then therefore uh, go towards making a balanced meal. So they do surveys in their own community, in their classes, in order to make some food. For example, if children want to make bhel or uh, some other food item, uh, then they have to do a survey. And that data is generated by children. And that data is used by children uh, as real data, Venn diagrams, graphs, etc. And then they are going to make that food, whatever food they voted for. In order to make the food, a lot of mathematics comes in. Proportion, uh, proportion, volume, uh, weight, measures, units of measurement. Uh, they're already making food. So hygiene, nutrition, biology, what is the impact of food? Life skills come in. Then they advertise for their food. There's marketing, there's business management, there's menu cards that they're making. So there's technology and there's languages and there's culture. So, so many things. Uh, food is such an integral part of human life uh, and, and health and well-being. So children do this from kindergarten to grade 11 with different levels of uh, mapping the competencies, et cetera, within it. So what we do is we map the competencies within that particular project. To take another example, here is a waste management project. So here children are collecting the waste from you know, whatever they are using. We always begin with the child's context. Teacher doesn't bring anything. If the teacher brings it, then that is a demonstrative mode. And then the children are passive. We tell the children, okay, what are you eating? Track that. 
what are you consuming look at the packaging in one week how many packets are you using or whatever so get that to school so they're bringing the packaging and then they're classifying that into biodegradable non biodegradable uh, what are the consumption patterns uh, uh, etc how much does it weigh you know the waste that i'm generating how much of how much is the weight of that and with all of that then they begin to also analyze the packets read the labels what is going into my body what does mrp mean uh, what are these additives that are put in so you can see the children are analyzing the labels of the foods that they eat and then they are also looking classifying between imported and local products so what does that mean in terms of economy and other things then they are also classifying in terms of the needs and wants do i really need this or is it just advertisement and peer pressure and other things that is forcing me or compelling me or am i being manipulated to buy this and then from there they then start having an awareness campaigns educating others to reduce the packaging to become aware that when you buy a packet of biscuits or anything else what how much of packaging is being generated and we are throwing this into the environment so all these are very important things that children can learn by by doing and when they are doing the things they are learning the different concepts whether it's environment science nutrition design uh, technology etc for example here look at the life cycle of let's say any any aerated uh, uh, thing that you're drinking so here comes visual arts graphic design environmental studies etc everything is integrated inside a project that the children are doing now of course the mapping the project is very important so here let's say creating a waste management solution this is a mapping now this is a very simple mapping with all the processes so let's say as part of the food that they were going to do they were also going to design an eco friendly container hmm? you can see on the top of it here uh, you can see this here so in order to do that the processes in an active form are analyzed so for example they will analyze boxes that have collected through paper folding activities they're going to learn ratio and proportion what is the difference between surface and volume about different kinds of areas etc uh, from there they go on to you know making a budget for the container making a prototype taking feedback etc so different processes which are involved different mathematical skills in order to make one eco friendly container to hold some healthy food that they have prepared or they may be running a, a waste management campaign so what are the different processes or uh, etc so i won't go into into details but after we have mapped the processes and children are also involved older children involved in the mapping the processes then comes the subject specific competencies so we are not beginning with the subject we are not beginning with the competency of the subject or the content i'm not starting with okay i am a language teacher i want to teach grammar or i am a maths teacher i have to teach fractions no what is a project that the children are doing they're interested in doing and what are the different things that they can learn through that when they undergo the different processes so collaborative planning by teachers is also an important part of this process connecting to indigenous knowledge is also important so our children for example here are making matka fridges which is coming from kutch you know a kind of a indigenous refrigerator and in doing so again so many concepts of uh, science and uh, culture and language etc because it's in local language so that is where you integrate the local languages by looking at the indigenous knowledge that the community has and connecting with the communities so uh, that's your textbook right rather than just looking at a textbook or to even bring in technology children make uh, films on a social issue of their own choice so here you can see there's a multimedia production what is a, what 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 is it that um, they are passionate about or what interests them it may be a one minute film but you know when you're making a film there is script writing there is storyboarding there is a, so there's grammar there's ethics you need permissions to shoot outside there's physics of uh, sound and there's technology there's lighting systems you know so there's so many things that you need to learn um, there are angles when you're shooting so there's mathematics so we are integrating subject competencies inside the project the children are doing and that is a part of the assessment so here also films are being done for sometimes genuinely for real uh professional people for example we made films for the election commission of india as a pilot project they also made films for the uh, municipal corporation our children also bid for tenders with the uh, municipal corporation they won them and they actually earned some money uh, which is a very gandhian uh, you know idea in a modern way of naitali so here you can see the children had made voter awareness cards 
uh, for voter awareness campaigns. So they had made such pledges which went out to, and they made jingles, they made slogans, they made short films. It went to a lot of uh, uh, cinema halls and people in Gujarat. And here you can see 75 lakh voters signed the voters pledge, uh, 71 lakh vote, uh, voters signed and sent it back to the government. So in that year, the voting uh, patterns were very high. A lot of people came out to vote. Children were involved. So this is a way to create citizenship. How do we expect young children to come out of schools and vote if they're not involved in the voting pro processes? Uh, are they not part of the community when they're in school? So this was also part of uh, the things that we did. And for this, of course, was one of the big awards that we got from the Election Commission for the school and for these children. Uh, we, that's why I'm very proud of this particular award. Uh, now, uh, there are other kinds of pedagogies that we use. Here you can see uh, this toy based pedagogy. So, I don't know if you can see me, but if you can, here is this particular toy that we've used here, which is a cup and ball. So, you know, when uh, uh, we've been using toys since a long time in the school, but the point is, uh, young children can use toys. What do we do with older children? So here I'm showing you an example. This is uh, the cup and ball, very common uh, wooden toy. And here you can see the children are playing with it. This is, uh, you can do it with seventh or eighth standard. And they're looking, they're observing and they're collecting the data. So always in our school, children collect the data themselves, whether it is in mathematics, whether they're looking at sports and they're shooting uh, basketball. So they're collecting data, they're playing football, they're collecting data here. It's a small game, they're doing that. How many successful attempts? If I change the length of string, then what will be the, you know, how, Will it, will, it, will it work better? Uh, how much time do I take? You know, how much time goes into it? What's the also circumference of the particular toy, et cetera? So explore physically the whole toy. And of course you play with it. So from the data collection, then children are then representing the data in a table. They're calculating statistics. They're looking at the probability of success and they're representing the data in, in graphs and they're analyzing this. So this is just a simple way to show you how with in a very simple way we can integrate even the use of local toys, etc. But the pedagogy is important, how you're using it and not going from textbook learning, but actually beginning with real life experiences with toys and fun and games, and then going to the abstract concept or definition at the end of it all. So we're always moving from concrete to abstract. Here you can see another example of uh, children making their own musical instrument with everyday materials. So they're first uh, looking at, you know, musical instruments uh, that are existing in our culture from beads and all of these different things. And then analyzing that, using even their bodies to understand about how vibration passes, using rods and strings, and from there on, making their own percussion instrument or other their own instruments with using everyday materials, and then doing an orchestra, playing the music together. So this is grade four or grade five, and you can see so many different competencies in science, from sound, amplitude, frequency, wavelength, properties of waves, vocal cords, structure and function of ears, or harmful effects of earphones, even they went up to that level. Language is learning poetry through music and vocabulary. They can use an instrument to narrate a poem or something. Uh, technology, again, understanding musical in instruments as complex machines, then uh, mathematics, making equations with sound patterns, complex maths and harmonics, humanities, of course, history of instruments, music, materials used, culture, geography, et cetera. And what kind of assessment can you have? Uh, well, if you want to do something complex, how sound is produced by an instrument can change with varying levels of water. Uh, what are the psychological effects or physio physiological effects of high levels of noise in humans, et cetera. I mean, the assessment task can be formative or summative depending on what the teacher wants with the children. Uh, another uh, ongoing project we do every year is making their own calendar. So children actually make a calendar with paper. Okay, so here this is handmade paper. Everything is drawn and done by calendar by the children. This is grade five project. You can see that they've gone out in the environment. They made a, a calendar on the trees of India, on the local trees. You can see they are sketching, they are drawing. Uh, they're shading it, they're making embroidery, they're learning how to make paper. And then they actually work with the uh, uh, printer to look at the formatting and what kind of paper we can use, what is a costing, and they make the calendars and they sell the calendars, raise the money, and then they 
um, donate the money for some charitable clause. But in, in making of the calendar itself, there are n number of concepts from the solar system, the lunar system, uh, the sun and moon, uh, uh, time and year and timelines, <clears throat> etc. that they are learning. So you can see which are leap year, which is not, uh, then also connecting it with the plants and the trees. So a lot of mathematics was done around it. And of course, um, all the different parts of in science, et cetera, with the trees. And you can see how beautiful the pages of the calendar here. You know, this is what they have. For example, February, you can see hand-drawn, handmade paper, something about the tree that they've selected. And then, of course, how they have drawn it. The names of the children are on every, you know, you can see the drawings and text at the bottom. The layout is done by children, et cetera. So the whole calendar was made like this. So this is an example. Um, of course, one of the questions then would be how we assess children also. So here is an interdisciplinary assessment. Children are making, um, so this is between human humanities, design, technology, arts, language, so many things can come together. So they're making, the designing jewelry with clay inspired from the Indus Valley and Egyptian civilizations. And they made a fashion show, they wore the jewelry, they displayed it, etc. And uh, that is one part of the group work. The other part you can see is that they made their own political party. They made their own posters. This is also because of elections going on in our context in Gujarat that time. So it was easy to look at what was happening outside and then mirror that, making their own symbols, et cetera. And they wrote their own manifestos, presented that. That was the assessment. And we gave feedback to each other. So the feedback is not coming from the teacher. The feedback is based on the task. It is based on criteria. So, you know, did you include concepts of civil or whatever was your language well structured uh, in the arts, you know, performing arts and visual arts with the poster. So there are criteria about the poster that can be brought in. So these are the things that we look at and we are assessing on very, very concrete work. Uh, the report card again, the progress report card. Now, you know, in India, we're talking about the holistic progress card, which is going to come out. Uh, this year, it's going to be rolled out for foundational years. And um, uh, the ministry is talking about a holistic 360 degree pro progress card. We have been doing this since the beginning of the school, since more than 20 years, we do not give marks to the children. What we do is the child, it begins with self-evaluation, peer feedback and parental feedback, which has again gone into the holistic progress card. So there are no marks. Uh, there is a qualitative feedback with the criteria, with rubrics of different achievement levels, which are there for the different tasks that the children have done under different subjects. So I'm putting the project first and under the project, there are the tasks that then, for example, making a poster or performing or making some jewelry or whatever, like I showed you or making a musical instrument. And in that, what were the different competencies or different subjects that came? We're just showing that. So different kinds of tasks can be a quiz, creative writing, hypothetical TV shows, imaginary interviews, podcasts, posters, making models, design solutions, making a board game or any game, role plays, et cetera. I'm sure you all know about it you're doing. But look at the kind of self-evaluation that can happen. You know, allow, allowing children to contribute to the um, reporting is very important. So children are talking about, what have I learned? And, uh, and look at what this child says. I thought that ignoring a person would solve a problem, but I realized that facing the situation by talking to the person would help solve the problem. And what another thing that my friends help me is to develop a positive attitude towards things. My classmates always motivate me and support me. So this is about wonderful things that the children, a child has written. Of course, I've only taken very small extracts. Now, now pure uh, evaluation of feedback is about qualitatively again. So you know that my friend is very in, you know, uh, focused and hardworking with a lot of imaginative ideas. Uh, of course, he might need to improve on his habit of distracting the class but he does accept the mistakes. He's passionate about history, he's confident, clever and mischievous. So very nice things written that both the children agree on and it goes into the report card. So I'm not reading everything, but even the parent feedback is always positive with a goal where, wherever you might say that there's an area of improvement um, for the child. The other pedagogies that we have is board games. So children are, you know, uh, India has a very rich culture in terms of, uh, folk tales, mythologies, epics, uh, old games like snakes and ladders was actually a game for spiritual growth to understand what is the level of your spiritual consciousness. 
so that has become very mundane today but originally the game was designed for something else so children actually not only playing games which are indian games then trying to make they they actually making their own games so you can see children are collaboratively deciding the rules um deciding what goes into it how they'll play and then testing it with the other children and playing it so that becomes they learn ethics they learn, learn values uh they use everyday materials so they are you know using texture and measurement and drawing and artwork i mean i don't have to go into the details you can see that already and here you can see the idea for me to is to link our stories and board games together so one of the games that we prepared was known as a pyasa kawa which is the thirsty crow and we made that into board games uh, for grade 1 and 2 along with the children and older children also made a board game based on the thirsty crow to look at as a crow flies over different topographies uh, what are the energy fuels what are the energy investment that the crow will do as it flies so there's a board game that grade 11 children made so encouraging children to make board games is interesting because they can take the board game home it is made on paper or cloth or whatever and they bring it back to school after playing with their siblings or grandparents or parents it brings communities together it brings our culture back in with good values and artwork you know indian artwork and also i think very fundamentally takes the children away from the screen time this is a major issue the world over you know children are uh, addicted to screens but as educators have we done other things and i can tell you from my experience children love working with their hands and they love playing even we as adults we used to we love playing those games you know rolling the dice and then picking up the card and doing things like that so uh, this is the other kind of pedagogy that i'm a uh, very happy to do and i'm working with the cbsc on something that we call peda games uh, hopefully this will be rolled out very soon also uh, with the cbsc as training programs for teachers across the country on peda games how to make your own board games uh, so of course when we talk about all this uh, teacher training is very important and one of my main work in this area is to promote experiential teacher training models uh, we ourselves have very much experience in teacher training where teachers are using their bodies and their senses and different materials and they and they do the things and then they analyze that that's how they are all learning uh if you want to look at some of the kind of work we do you can go to the diksha platform and look at this paper planes model that we've done um it's an experiential learning course uh, with tata trust and tis that we made and it is on the diksha platform you'll have to locate it somewhere if you google it, it you probably get it i mean if you go on to the diksha platform i would encourage teachers to see this it's a full fledged course that has been designed with video films and everything that we have done in our school the entire pedagogy of how to implement experiential learning using everyday materials you will get a free training there already now coming back as i head towards the end of my presentation you know when we had I mean when you go something undergo something as drastic as what my husband and I went through which is the hardest exam of all which is when you lose the most important part of your life which is your child I think it you begin to question things and my husband and I went on a quest and what happened very interestingly was we began to receive messages from Tara in the form of poetry and uh, messages from other people but written messages that we would find paper hidden somewhere in a book in a drawer uh, in my purse and i don't know how we found that but we always did and that became a journey for us to explore and understand what is the role of intuition because tara was very intuitive she always said i'm not interested in growing older i don't want to be a teenager and i couldn't understand what she was talking about and she would say uh i would say why do you why do you say that and she said because i don't want to leave you mama that's why i don't want to grow older and i didn't understand what she's talking about and she also spoke a lot about the body and the soul about the energy she told us that she chose my husband and myself as her parents and she was very proud of that so all these things began to maybe guide us and make sense after she left and uh, that's how pascal and i went on to a new journey which was to explore what is consciousness and there we realized that there are three important things which is intuition the intention that you put and the imagination that's what constitutes the consciousness and um if you go on to youtube and google mgi's mind over matter or go on to our website on mgi's.in you'll find this film this is based on a rice experiment which is done by a uh, japanese uh, scientist not a scientist but an experimenter uh whose name was Masaru Masaru Emoto who looked at the effect of emotions and language on water 
saying that water has memory. And one of the experiments is a rice, rice experiment where we put rice into three beakers and gave different emotion from positive emotion to negative emotion. And the third beaker is ignored. And for three, for one month, we did this consistently in the morning. This was done by kindergarten children in our school. So, you know, there was no research or bias there. And the results were astounding. The, the rice that was thanked was white. The rice that was uh, hated or given a negative emotion uh, was, uh, it had very brown colored water. And the rice that was ignored was the worst. It had actually worms that came out but died. So the rice which was thanked had worms which were, which were there, which were surviving inside the water. So it was a very interesting, and we did this several times and more or less we've always had similar results. Uh, you can try it out yourself. You may or may not get the same results. I don't know, but it's a very interesting experiment to do, which leads us to the idea of what is the role of our thoughts and emotions on ourselves because we are 70% of our bodies make, is made up of water. And what is the role of emotions with others. And when you ignore somebody, in, in a way we understood that when you ignore somebody, it's the worst thing because you're killing the soul of that child. So it's very important in education, what we think, not just what we say and do. From there, we went on to experiment more and more. And Pascal and I went all over the world. We went to Ireland, we went to Portugal, we went to London and France. And we began to not only learn, but we also began to share our techniques um, across the world about intuition. So here uh, they, the teachers are learning about, you know, touching the tree and the children also learn touching the tree and getting information, asking a question to nature or to the tree, and then you get a response. Actually, you may call it your higher self. You may call it, uh, you know, somebody from within yourself uh, or subconscious, but it doesn't matter. You do get a response. The other uh, thing that we are, the technique is psychometry where they're using that, you know, we are, they've exchanged objects and we are uh, touching the object and getting information about the other person through the object. And this had absolutely amazing uh, information that we got. The teachers actually picked up on information about the other person, which there was no way they could have known. Very, very personal information and very specific things that they got. So psychometry and of course, energy techniques. So here children are using energy and intuition to even make a career choice. So my rational brain is telling me I should go for this course in this college, but I'm not, I'm uneasy about it. So what can I do in terms of energy, intuition, guided meditation, relaxation, and accessing another part of my consciousness to, to know whether this is the right path or not. Now, these things are not only um, all just, uh, you know, subjective. This is also based on works of scientists, both Indian and Western from Rupert Sheldrake, Amit Goswami, Bruce Lipton, Gary Zukav. So all the new science which is coming in terms of quantum physics, uh, biology, you know, epigenetics, etc. In the end, I would like to, uh, my last slide coming back to Tara. And this is little Tara in our school and you can see the beautiful halo and energy around her. And she says this, she says, there's another poem of hers, the world they say, the world they said, the world is a big place and I'm small but I matter because I am matter. You know, for the, for the brief time that we are on this earth, every child matters. And I think that's Tara's message. That's the door she opened for Pascal and myself to share with all the children in this world, with all the teachers. We are no longer talking about copyrights. Pascal and I and, and, and at MGI's all teachers were ready to share everything that we have. Because children, no matter whose child it is, no matter in which school, which area and context it is, Every child is important. That's how we've chosen this profession. And every child must be happy. And every child must discover why are they born? Why are they here? Who am I? And why am I here? And that we must, for, to, in order to achieve that, we must shift and um, change our pedagogical models going towards more holistic forms of education and joyful forms of learning. Yes, thank you very much. That was my presentation and I can see I'm in good time. Yeah, ma'am. So touching, so much connected, practical wisdom. Raji, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. So Wonderful. Lot of, lot of comments in the yeah. chat box also. Okay, I would love to see in the chat box. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, wow. Wonderful. 
Oh, this is very touching for me also. So, you know, that is my life purpose. My life purpose is to, to reach out to more teachers. So if I've been able to do that, then I'm happy. And so is Tara. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am, for such a you know, touching and uh, very practical ways of making happy children in school. Mm -hmm. it, it, Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm open to questions or comments or whatever feedback you'd like to say to any participant. I think, Raji, ma'am, we should start with uh, Guru Prem, sir. <laughs> ah, Diwali ma'am is there. Very touching. Touched touch deep inside somewhere in the corner. I met her in Banaras also oh. and attended her program there. Mm -hmm. I met her husband also. They are purposeful things. I'm planning to go to visit their school so that I'll learn so many things from them. Hmm? Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Pleasure, sir. Yeah. Yeah, may, God, sir. may God bless you with the more energy to do more jobs. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Guru Prem, sir, you please take me along, you know, so I, I wish to go to her school. Ma'am, I have a program uh, called uh, Handwriting Lab. Yes. We have experimented in uh, lakhs of students. <laughs> this program, I really want to give a voluntary to your school. Uh, I would love to. Love to. <laughs> uh, it's it's a very it. important part. Handwriting, I've been saying it's a spiritual thing and it can yes. shape us in so many different ways. We would love to have and I would then love to share with more people whatever please, I learned from you. Please, give me an opportunity. I will come there. I will train your entire teachers. I myself will come. I will come with Definitely. my family just to visit your school. Uh, this is son of my agenda. <laughs> definitely, uh, my definitely. Agenda now. Well, I would like to thank the participants. They've all been uh, putting such lovely messages. And some I know also, I can see uh, known names and some um, have come back to, you know, uh, always they are there. So thank you. Thank you for the very warm comments uh, that everybody. Diwali, ma'am. Ma yes, 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 I wanted to. I wanted to. <laughs> Diwali ma'am, sorry to interrupt ma'am. Ma'am, can you just adjust your camera ma'am, little bit please? Uh, yeah, fantastic, yeah. So, uh, I would just wanted to thank Anju for the beautiful presentation that she made and a very crisp presentation, very, very much in time. And uh, there's a lot of learning from what you have shared. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what has been your biggest challenge when you were trying to implement what? Whatever you dreamed of and whatever you learned from your daughter. Beautiful. Very, very beautiful. So if you're talking about the intuitive part, are you talking about the experiential five senses part? Because these are... Uh, both, both. Because, you know, there would be something which has come from the intuition, which you would find very, very difficult, I think, to implement, you know. And particularly getting, you know, getting other people to buy in your yes. ideas and... How long did it take you and how did you go about it? That's a that would be a beautiful journey that every principal can kind of learn from. So the you first know. thing I want to uh, share with all the participants, I did not show that photograph, but you see, when we started the school, we faced agitations. I mean, there was bus burning, riots, <laughs> um, public interest litigation against us. My husband and I were attacked physically so many times and there was police here and uh, it lasted nine months of an agitation against this project. So this project itself, our school was born out of a lot of tapasya and it needed a lot of uh, conviction uh, to, to continue on that track. And we did, and luckily we won the PIL in the high court and it went to Supreme Court. So that was a first challenge. After that, when children came to our school, you know, who would want to put their children into a school where there are no textbooks and no exams and no, you know, 22. Today it's very much more accepted, but that time it was very new. So. Uh, uh, we got children who were rejects of other schools, children who were not performing well in the regular system, children with learning difficulties, uh, children who were naughty, emotional trauma. There was one kind of uh, group of kids. And the other was, well, some parents were convinced that, yeah, this is going to be a great idea. I mean, this is the model we want. So we had two ends of different kinds of parents. And we had to succeed with these children who were in difficulty. 
And in the initial years, when my children, my students used to go out into the, you know, by what you call parties or their own, uh, you know, um, marriages or functions, then they would be told, oh, you're going to Mahatma Gandhi International School. That's a school where they don't teach anything. It's a school for retards. And we were always inclusive. And because we didn't have exams, and then there were these all these questions, oh, but how will they uh, adjust? And how come they'll be disciplined? If you're not having uniforms, how's the discipline? You know, we have 20% of our children coming from underprivileged backgrounds, from municipal schools into our school. Today, some of them are teachers in my school. And uh, that was a whole challenge that diversity was an important tool to learn in the classroom. So we have children from very poor families, who can't afford, but they are given full scholarship with children from the middle class, with children from very elite families. And what they pay helps us to subsidize the education of the others. We've had differential fee system all through the years. So the challenge was also to, to break that idea that learning can happen only in that fixed way of textbooks, that, that learning isn't elsewhere, that play isn't learning. But slowly over a period of time, parents got convinced because kids were happy. The second thing was, about discipline, but they found that our children were more relaxed, more disciplined. It took some time. I had to do workshops with parents to, to make them understand about the pedagogy. So we would do activities with them and then they, we would make them reflect. So that also helped a lot. And uh, so these were the initial channel challenges. Um, about the intuition part, you know, I don't think parents are still entirely ready for it. And though this is India, India has such a strong um, philosophical, uh, you know, and spiritual tradition. So it's not religious, I'm talking about spiritual, but yet we're not ready to integrate it into school education. And to me, this is the biggest learning. You know what I went through and, and life throws terrible storms at you. And you don't, then you try to do things on your own. But what if we learned in school itself? If we gave tools to children, they don't have to do it now, but sometime when they're 25 or 30, they'll go back and they say, oh, you know, I did that technique. Let me use that technique and find my answers. You know, simple things like dowsing for water. You know, villages, they use dowsing. They use a pendulum or that stick. These are indigenous techniques. They, they, it's not occult or something. Why aren't we doing that? We can find that to, you know, use, uh, find answers. So yes, these are challenges. But I'll tell you one thing. Our school is very small. People said, oh, you've got just 200, 300 children. Uh, you, how are we going to change the system just with that? This doesn't answer the needs of the country. But look, Everything we did went into the NEP 2020. NEP 2020 is talking about that. The holistic progress card is about this. So it has taken 20 years, but it is mainstream now. People are going to accept it. So I think the way forward is do what you know is important for the children. As educators, I can't be dishonored. I mean, we have to think about in terms of karma and dharma. You know, If it's my dharma, I must do it. And not bother about the fruits. Will it succeed or not? I didn't know. But it has succeeded, and I'm very glad about that. <laughs> yes, I do realize that children, you know, like what you said was that there were a lot of children who are underprivileged or uh, maybe retarded, as they were called, but they are the fastest learners. You know, yeah. they learn differently and they are the fastest learners. They're very bright. Even their parents are very participative because they have the challenge of teaching their own child. Yes. So thank you so much, Andrew. And I would love to visit your school and I will visit your school. I promise you that. It's a great pleasure. <laughs> all, our, all our family members can plan it together, ma'am. Yes. All our family members can plan it together and give Anju ma'am a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yeah. my our doors are open to all the participants and uh, people. It's an open door thing. We don't prevent anybody from coming and sitting in our classrooms. That's the oh, lesson. That's and any teacher who tells me we want a module, we print it and give it to them. So you always oh, share beautiful. it. Lovely, lovely. I would share you all, you're all about what I learned from you today. I'll share it around as much as I can. Thank you. <laughs> great, great, ma'am. So shall we move? Uh, Anju, ma'am, uh, our uh, one more program is there for 15 minutes. I request you to stay back uh, for that program that is about some, uh, you know, about wellness. So we have a master, Soumya, ma'am. Shall we start that? Uh, maybe one minute earlier? Does it, yeah, it is almost six now. Six to six fifteen. I request all the participants to stay back at least once in a week. We will do something for ourselves. Okay, uh, Soumya, ma'am, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, I'm so impressed by Miss Anju because she's talking about 
uh, wellness which is holistic like uh, it's not only about physical because uh, within the 15 minutes i try to put in something for the emotion something for uh, for your know, for your mental health something for the spiritual health so i uh, just package it like that so uh, that is what even whatever i have i resonate with your uh, uh, mind and your uh, attitude so thank you so much ma'am for for the start because i'm going to continue with, uh, with that uh, so um, uh, I, i'll just sing two lines because music has no language so i'm going to sing uh, 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 yeah. uh, sound is, is your audio is perfect some some kind of sound some noise is there is it my problem or i don't know is it audible others now? others is okay then it will be my issue no even i can hear a, a static some sound kind of, yeah static sound is there uh, now now how is it Oh, ma'am, ma ma I time. tell you exactly when you know the olden kind of time when we put the radio, we <laughs> will get this kind of. Is it so? <laughs> no, it's now. Yeah, perfect, it? perfect, 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 perfect. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fine now. It's fine. You just switch on the AC. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you okay, are at Madrid. I think, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, maybe the fans uh, volume, maybe, yeah. fan sound, maybe. Okay, then. Uh, so I'll just start with a small song. Can we all close our eyes? And I want all your videos to be on. So I want I want all your videos to be on. So let's start with the two line prayer. That's all. Omkaranatham Murangum Prabanjam Odakuralinde Sangeetanatham Manasavadil Turakunanatham Vishwaprabanjam Kovilinadayil Omkaranatham Murangum Prabanjam Odakuralinde Sangeetanatham Thank you all. Now, uh, as I have already told you, you all have your blessing note, I think. Ha do you have your blessing note with you? Let's start with, uh, uh, with feeling of gratitude because we uh, that's so important that a mind gets polluted with lot of things which we see which we watch which we whatever we read and there's there, there are loads coming in our whatsapp so it's very important to declutter our mind it's not heard okay it's very important to declutter our mind so the feeling of gratitude and counting your blessings does so much to our mental health and our emotional health. So take your blessing note. Write 10 people who have contributed value to your life. If you don't have a blessing note, you just, but it's good to have a blessing note every day at the end of the day. Just think of your blessing or even a slight small thing is enough just if we start writing it down it will really help as a feeling of gratitude in our mind uh, that we we start counting the blessings we start seeing life as a as a wonder like as we grow up when we grow up into an adult that uh, wonder that innocence to see the world we just slowly it fades from us so let's bring back that let's see the world with a wonder with the eyes of a child so uh, as I talk it's time for you to write down your blessings when you write each person's uh, name just feel have that a uh, one second gratitude in your mind just a second of gratitude for that person who has contributed value to your life Let's start with a feeling of gratitude. We may ignore a lot of people who are, we may take people for granted. You know, they are doing a lot of things for us, but we just ignore. So like the rice experiment, we ignore one rice, one uh, bottle of rice, right? So let's not ignore small things around us. Let's observe and these are all our blessing. Let's start doing it. 
maybe you can continue it maybe tomorrow how many i mean each day you can write five 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 persons who give value who are significant in your life maybe in a day maybe some person would have given you a tea at the right time when you really feel thirsty so that person is a is a he's a blessing that tea is in the right time it's a blessing for you so like that small things around us happening around us let's start capturing those and writing it down so next um okay this you can uh, do it and every day uh, i would really request you to write at least one or two blessings at the end of the day before you go to bed so you go to bed in that feeling of gratitude next uh, today i would like to uh, uh, tell you some immune points uh, for the uh, boosting in boosting of the immune system so as i show you the immune points you just press press with your thumb uh maybe uh, now for the time being we'll just give pressure for 30 seconds but you can do it for 1 minute every day that's up to you now as we have a short of time i'll just tell you the points and we'll give pressure for just 30 seconds or so so the first immune point is just fold the elbow fold your uh up you can see uh ma'am can we pin your can we pin your video please yeah yeah please please pin, please pin your uh, please but we are not yeah, now it's pinned yes thank you now it's pinned thank you thank you so much yeah now if you fold your hand you can see a a line here that a uh, line between your arms and this hand just press at that point okay the same way you can give simultaneously to the other hand also just fold it and with the thumb just press at this joint at the point now i think you all can see me yeah, yeah. here yeah the same point get the same point and as you press you tell in your mind i am vibrant energy i am vibrant energy i am vibrant energy feel that energy in you feel that your each cell in your body is getting energized you can give a press for 1 minute but now i am just cutting it short now take your the second immune point is take your uh, hand and you just uh, join the uh, thumb and the pointy finger and you can see a hump here hump you can feel a hump this point so press there and in your mind tell i am beautiful i am beautiful all of us are beautiful all of us are unique no one can be like us i am special like that each one of you is special so i am beautiful just press that hum that's one point the other point the same way to other 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 hand the if you close it if you close keep it closed you can feel the hum you just press it and say i am love you imagine that your heart is filling with love it's filling with pink color and it's full of love you have love for yourself you have love for all your loved ones all your fellow beings if you are teachers you have love for your students so imagine your heart is slowly filling up filling up with love i am love yes now we have learnt one this is one immune point and another the hum and the third one you have the collarbone here you have the collarbone just below the collarbone you can see a dip a small dip dip here just below the collarbone if you If you just bring your hands down, fingers down, you can feel a dip here. Just press there. I am balanced. 
I am balanced. Let the emotions come and go, but we should know how to manage, how to balance our emotions, how to stay balanced. So we should not react immediately. We have to wait, give a pause and respond. So that's, you should have the balance. I am balanced. I can balance my work life and my family life. I am balanced. The next point is center of the chest. Center of the chest. Yes, I am courage. I have the power. Each one of us, ha we have power in us, but we don't realize. So I am, I have courage. I'm courage. Yes. Like Anjuma. Anjuma is so courageous to try something different. So like that, all of us can do it. So we have to. I am courage. Now, you just, I'll just turn and show to you. Base of the skull. You have this uh, hump. You have the skull, base of the skull. Just go to the base of the skull and press with your thumb. I am wisdom. I am wisdom. I am wisdom. We all know how to differentiate, what to differentiate. We cannot consume all the WhatsApp messages. We should know what to take, what not to take, what to read, what not to read. So that is the other one. Next, um, I'll show one leg, okay? But you can do it simultaneously. You just, this is a knee. Keep three fingers and below that. Just three fingers and just below that. Press, I'm physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually balanced and healthy. I am physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually healthy. So you can uh, do our uh, two legs uh, together. Press. I am physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually healthy. Yes, you need to spend just five minutes every day for that. Uh, you can watch the video once again so that you will get to know all the points. The first here, then second, third, fourth, back of the skull, five and below the knee, six. So six immune points every day with the affirmation. You just spend five minutes. That's all. Nothing more, more than that. So that will, uh, what, what you say, the affirmations will actually give you confidence and you feel uh, that, you, you feel the flow in you the whole day. Okay, now next, let's uh, go to our physical, our movement session. Okay, I think you all have a small space and if you have a towel or something, you just grab a towel or you can grab your dupatta, something. You can grab your dupatta or towel, anything or even imaginary also, no issues. You can even imagine. Okay, today we are going to do washing the clothes. Uh, not in the washing machine, sorry. Uh, you have a stone here. So I'll show you the basic movements. Just do with me, then we'll play the music and we are going to do that. Okay, so first, like uh, we, uh, we, uh, we are going with a bucket. Okay, out. We are going out with the bucket. Just move front and back. Move front and back. Now we place it and take the cloth. Okay, so uh, you just, just put the soap on it. So you are moving one hand static and other hand like applying soap. And you do this. Like you are, um, what to say? On the stone, you are just uh, 
dabbing it tap 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 so just move so i will be doing only all these simple movements which all can do moving like this and up and down then we are just hanging it okay now i'll show the basic leg movement nothing much okay one tap one tap mostly we will do only this then we are going to cross the midline okay you can uh, move your one leg in front so these are the basic movements we are going to juggle only with these leg movements so nothing much dance is only our daily day daily uh, whatever we do it's not a very complicated thing take your leg at the back take your leg at the back keep your foot at the back now maybe we will move two two steps this side two steps this side isn't it easy it's all very simple steps then move front and kick move back move front and kick move back then some kicking that's it that's it we are going to dance only with these so nothing much nothing complicated and we are going to wash our clothes so get ready get um what to say if you have a cloth or a towel you just get something for yourself <clears throat> if i play the music uh, uh, just one of you should tell me whether yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, audible or what yeah yeah 